Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to today's Play Attention webinar. My name is Gwen Thorley, and I will be your host today. I'm glad to see we have a large audience here today. Some of you are current clients, so you've already started your Play Attention program, and some of you are still considering Play Attention and deciding whether or not it's the right learning tool for you. Now, today's event, we're not going to go so much into exactly how Play Attention works. So if you are interested in more of the background on the technology and how Play Attention works, I would recommend one of our informational webinars that we have weekly. Our next is scheduled for next Wednesday. So if you do want to attend that event, you can register on our website or you can just type in the Q&A box here and I'll make certain that you are registered for that event. Now, there are a couple of things I want to mention before we get started. One is that we are recording this event, so if you need to share it with any other staff members or family members, you'll be able to do so. You'll receive an email follow-up uh, after this webinar, and that will have the link to the recording. If at any time you do have questions, please type your questions in the Q&A box by, found in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. And please do ask your questions, and in this webinar, really make comments as we go along because your questions and comments will really help all of the others here today and enhance everyone's experience. Now, if at any time you do lose connection, don't worry. Uh, once your internet has resumed, you'll be able to just log back into the presentation. Now, there's a bit of an agenda that we'll be going through today. And uh, we will be, of course, talking about a few things that were mentioned when you registered. We're going to discuss very briefly the differences between an IEP and a 504. Now, as I'm going through this agenda, if you would, in the Q&A box, just so I can get a better idea, uh, if you have an IEP, type in IEP. If you have a 504, type in 504, so we can all get a better idea of who's in our audience today and what we're looking at here. And perhaps some of you are actually uh, teachers or professionals and you're assisting with an IEP or a 504 plan for your students or clients. So we're going to talk about some differences between the IEP and 504. We're going to review some sample goals and accommodations. Now these came from you uh, as our uh, audience members. You submitted those samples and we're going to review those. Once we reviewed those, we're going to discuss how Play Attention can help your child or your student actually reach those goals. And we'll also discuss how your personal executive function coach here at Play Attention can help customize your Play Attention plan to make certain that we're addressing your particular needs. All right, thank you for those who have written in uh, your responses. Iona says she has an IEP. Jean says she has an IEP for speech and a 504 for ADHD. That's a really good point, uh, Jean. And so you have two different uh, types of plans there. Christy says, I don't currently have either. We are a small school and need to create one. Okay, excellent. Margo says she has an IEP. Uh, Brittany says she has a 504. Looks like we're pretty split down the middle as far as IEPs and 504s. So let's just look briefly um, at the differences between the two. But before we do that, we want to talk about it's strengthening executive function, because that really is our goal here. Executive function is, you can think of it as the CEO of your brain, right? It controls your attention. It controls emotion and behavior. It helps you plan, prioritize, organize, avoid procrastination, and remain on task. How many of you can relate to those things that are difficult right now for your student or your child and maybe part of your IEP or your 504 plan. So when we're looking at how to help your child or your student really reach those goals, we have to look at strengthening executive function because that is the key. And we know that 90% of our students with ADHD also have weak executive function. The interesting thing is that many other uh, students who have different learning difficulties uh, also struggle with executive function. 
and even our students who are gifted and talented. You know, many of our students who are ADHD are also gifted and talented, or they may have a learning difference, but they're still gifted and talented, but may still struggle with executive function. So you can have a very bright individual. I don't want you to think that because you have an IEP or a 504, uh, that's they're below average. Of course, many of these students are very bright. We just need to put accommodations in place to help them reach their potential. So the question is, how is your school addressing the needs of these students? Typically, that's done in the form of an IEP or a 504. So if we look at the differences here, and if any of you want to uh, have this uh, sent to you, we have a a great graph that came from understood.com and it actually has the differences between the IEP and 504. So if you would like a copy of this, just let us know and uh, we'll send that to you. You can type it in the Q&A box that you would like this uh, graph here. It's much more detailed uh, when you receive the entire thing. But an IEP, of course, is a blueprint or a plan for a child's special education experience, where a 504 is a series of accommodations, okay? So the, the IEP really has a set of benchmarks. It is very specific in how you're going to reach each goal and how that child is going to move through the special education experience, where the 504, it may not even be in a written form, although if you are a parent, I would encourage that you have the school put the plan down in writing. So if you have a 504, that's typically a series of accommodations to help that child maximize his experience in school. Now, who can get each plan is the question we get a lot. An IEP, in order to get an IEP, and it is, of course, a little bit harder to get the IEP, uh, the IEP must have one of 13 specific disabilities that's listed in IDEA, and it must affect your child's educational performance. A 504 plan is much broader, so that can be any disability. It can even be, you know, it could be from an accident. If he broke his leg, they could have a 504. It could be diabetes. It could be ADHD. So a 504 plan includes any disability, such as, a, as in learning or attention issues. So it is much broader. How do we typically measure academic success? What is your answer to that question? Go ahead and type your answer in the Q&A box. When we're determining academic success, how is that determined? If you would, just type in your thoughts in that Q&A box. Margo says standardized testing. Karen says end of grade tests. Sheila says report cards. Nathaniel says that he judges it by quizzes and tests in the classroom. Okay, so a lot of you are saying quizzes, tests, in order to really assess academic success and achievement. I have a couple others here coming in. Christy says visible growth different for each student. Absolutely. It can be different for each student. But usually the schools will go by those end of grade standardized tests in order to really see how that student has grown over the years, which, as you know, may not always be really accurate. But in order to really ace that end of grade test, right? In order for them to be able to show what they know or to complete that large project that was assigned to them, it might be a big science project or it might be a big book report that they have to do. What do they need to have in place? It's more than just academics because I know many of you right now can think of your child or a student who is really bright who really knows the material, but at the end of grade test, fails miserably. How many of you can relate to that? Type Y for yes. Right, a lot of you are saying yes. 
Absolutely. And why is that? You know, so it has to be more than just the basic understanding of how to read, how to write, how to do math. There's more to it. In order to really show what they know, they have to have strong executive function. And that's what our plan within Play Attention is going to do. And really, it's what many of your IEP and 504 goals were reviewing, right? Many of you have submitted uh, different 504 goals and IEP goals that we're going to look at shortly. And many of them are working towards that. But when you are reviewing your goals, you should make certain that your goals are working towards strong executive function and self-regulation, because that's what they need in order to really reach their potential and show what they know. So let's look at some of the examples that all of you have written in for today's presentation. These are your examples of what's currently in your IEP and 504 plans. Many of you had uh, duplicates in there, which I'm sure you can imagine is very common. But many of you cited that your goals for this year was to address social skills, right? So you want to help your child or your student develop social cognition or behavior and begin to recognize social cues. That's really difficult because we have a lot of parents who will call in and they'll say, you know, my daughter is so sweet and yet she struggles with friendships. She can make friends. She just can't keep friends. And that's usually, especially when we're working with a child who has an attention difficulty, it's usually because they're simply not paying attention to the social cue, right? They, they miss the look. They miss the shake of the head. So how are we going to reach this goal? How can we help improve the area so they can actually recognize that social cue, process that information, and then give a response? Also, many of you talked about organization, and there were many different accommodations that you had. Uh, some of you had assignment planners to help them. Now, assignment planners are great, but how many of you have an assignment planner that's written into the 504 as one of the accommodations, and yet that assignment planner never gets home, or it gets home and it's not completed? Uh, how many of you have experienced that? So we have to look at the accommodations and make certain that we have all the steps in place. If it's an assignment planner, great, but it needs to be an assignment planner. There has to be a specific time where that child is to fill in the assignment planner. It should be checked by either a teacher or an assistant, and then it should be in that student's backpack, there should be accommodations to make certain it's in the backpack and it makes it home. So just saying he's going to be able to have an assignment planner many times is not enough. So make certain that when you're looking at your different accommodations, it's an accommodation that's going to work from start to finish. So some of you had an assignment planner. Uh, some of you are getting assistance with time management. Remember, this was part of that executive function and organizational skills. Because remember, the biggest part of executive function is that it helps us plan, prioritize, organize our materials, and remain on task. This is exactly what many of you have cited in your plans. <clears throat> we also look at memory. One of you wrote down that you have a locker key lock instead of the combination. Uh, and I'm assuming that is because your child has difficulty a difficult time remembering that combination. Uh, some of you have the use of verbal cues. And one of you had written down that you have the, the use of a multiplication sheet. Many times uh, we allow our students to use a multiplication sheet or if they're younger, an addition sheet or subtraction sheet because they have a hard time remembering math facts. So we're going to talk about that as well and how we can improve those areas. Because again, I'm certain if you have a child or a student with an attention difficulty, oftentimes you notice that one day they know all of their multiplication facts and the next day it's like they've never seen them before. And there's a reason for that. And we're going to talk about how we can address that within play attention. 
Now, there was a lot of talk about helping your child or your student focus and remain on task. One of you wrote down that you had extended time up to three days for homework assignments. Uh, many of you had extended test time. Uh, one person wrote in that there are frequent checks to make certain he's on task. Uh, frequent breaks were given to some of you. And one person's goal was to get to a point where there's only required one redirection. Okay, so these were the different areas we were looking at as far as focus and remaining on task. Now, something I want to bring up here, when we talk about how play attention is going to help support these goals, we want to keep in mind that our end goal should be that they are able to do these things independently, right? It is wonderful that you have an accommodation right now that says you have extended test time. I understand it. I was a classroom teacher. I had lots of students who needed that. And it's great that you have, uh, one of you has actually three days to get those assign homework assignments in. But that won't always work for your child, right? Or your student. Because eventually that child or student who now may be nine years old is going to be 39 years old and is going to be in the workplace. And when they're in the workplace, if they haven't been able to develop executive function and strengthen self-regulation, when they get into the workplace, unfortunately, that's where they have a hard time sticking with time constraints. They have a hard time getting assignments in on time at work because the boss isn't going to be able to make these accommodations for them. So really, when we talk about play attention helping you support your goals, we have to make certain that the real goal is to getting them to a point where these accommodations are no longer needed. We need them now, but we need to take this time to help them develop these skills so that we can make lifelong changes. And then also many of you talked about the ability to filter distractions. And because your child or your student is very distractible, both uh, by auditory or visual distractions, I would say almost 90% of the people who wrote in about their IEPs and 504s had preferential seating. Uh, one person was very specific and said that their child is allowed to sit in the front seat closest to the teacher. And I'm certain that is to limit the distractions and help with that proximity control. Um, so again, we need to have this accommodation now but we need to put programs in place so that we're teaching him how to filter distraction and how to remain on task without that teacher redirecting. And that's what our goal is within Play Attention. Play Attention's goal is to help develop the cognitive skills that lay the foundation for strong executive function. Because if we want them to be organized, if we want them to be able to pick up on social skills, social cues, if we want them to be able to be able to control their emotions and not be explosive in their responses, we have to be able to get them to a point where they're able to process and to stay focused. And all of that is done within play attention. That's our plan, is to make certain that we develop those cognitive skills and unlock each person's potential. We do this, of course, through our combination of our feedback-based technology with cognitive skill training and behavior shaping. So if you are currently using Play Attention, you have that body wave armband, right? And if for some of you who have not yet started your program, this body wave armband has three sensors. And those sensors monitor brain activity that tells us how attentive you are. And that information is then given over to the computer where they're actually able to control all of our cognitive exercises by mind alone. And they get constant and immediate feedback as to whether or not they truly are focused and paying attention. So this is what I want you all to Really keep in mind, whether you are a current client or you're just looking into play attention, the power behind play attention is this integrated approach where we're monitoring 
a ten of state, and then we're working on very specific cognitive skills that we're going to talk about here in depth in a little bit. Now, when we're working on those cognitive skills, if you want to work on attention, if you want to work on uh, filtering distractions or memory, since we're monitoring your attention, and you can only start the activities when you are in your peak attentive state. It means when you are working on any of the play attention activities, you have to be actively engaged. And that is the key. They cannot just simply go through the motions when they're using play attention. They have to be actively engaged in order to start the activity or keep the activity running and then practice all of those cognitive skills that we need for strong executive function. Not only that, but for those of you who have behavior goals written into your IEP or your 504, we have a full behavior shaping program in the system as well. And this is really key. You know, I when I was a classroom teacher, I had a student named Jaylon, and I'll talk about him a couple times during this webinar probably. Uh, but with behaviors, that was one of our goals was to help him learn how to control his fidgeting his calling out. Uh, he had a lot of self-distracting behaviors. And initially when I asked him, you know, because we had, before we were working with play attention, we had the checklist. I would give him verbal cues or we had um, a cue that no one else would know. You know, I would touch my nose and that would give him the signal that he was doing one of those behaviors so that he could try to self-correct. And so we did those things that probably many of you are doing now if you're a teacher in the classroom and the teachers have talked to you as a parent about the things that they're going to put into place to help them learn how to control behaviors. But when I asked Jaylon why he thought it was important, because I would be teaching math and he'd call out what he did over the weekend, just random things that ever popped into his mind. So I asked him, why do you think it's important that you don't call out? And he said, because you tell me not to. So he really didn't know. And that was a big aha moment for me, right? Because I always took it for granted that they knew why it was important, but he really didn't. He thought it was important because I told him not to. But you and I both know that that's not enough to make a change, not enough to make personal change. So when we got to the play attention session, and if you're using play attention right now with your child or your students, and you're incorporating this uh, behavior shaping tool, keep this in mind how powerful it is. Because if, if you're playing, let's say, attention stamina, remember attention stamina is that ability to direct and sustain attention. And they're gonna choose from different characters. One is a whale. They'll see that whale going across the screen. Once he's focused and paying attention, he was able to push that whale down to the bottom of the ocean just with his attention alone. When he got distracted, and usually that would be his, his calling out, he'd have that whale down at the bottom of the ocean, and then he'd call out, I like SpaghettiOs, and immediately that whale would start to float up. Now, I have a real teachable moment, right? It's not just me in the classroom touching my nose to let him know that he's doing a behavior that's not appropriate or that he has to control. I have a teachable moment here. So after that activity, I say to him, you know, what happened to that character when you started to call out? Well, he floated up. So what does that mean? It means I'm not paying attention. So in the classroom, when you call out, what does that mean? I'm not paying attention. So now he gets that one-to-one -one correlation on how that behavior actually affects his attention. And we set behavioral goals throughout the program. And so more importantly, not only is he able to now monitor it, but he now knows that he can control it because he's seen himself control it during our session. So he would get back to the classroom and of course he'd call out, but then he'd cover his mouth and he'd look at me like, you're right, I do do that. So there was this realization that he was actually doing it where before he was unaware. And I'm sure a lot of you have students who call out or they're humming and you look at them and you ask them to stop and they look back at you and think, I wasn't doing that. So there's an awareness. Now, not only are you teaching them how to become aware of it and monitor it, 
but you're teaching them how to control it. And that's where you're going to see the real behavioral changes take place. So this is how we're going to move from those great accommodations that you have in your 504, where we're, you know, giving them little signals or little cues or tracking their behaviors on our charts. We're moving them from needing that accommodation to actually teaching them how to self-regulate and self-monitor. That's where you're going to see the real behavioral changes take place. Now, if any of you have questions as I'm going through these different modules, please do ask. So again, we're integrating feedback technology with cognitive skill training and behavior shaping to reinforce the cognitive skills that they need in order to improve and reach all of those goals that we just reviewed in your IEPs and your 504s. So let's look at uh, just social skills. That's one of the areas that you mentioned. Uh, many of you have IEPs or 504s in place where you're going to be working on social cueing. So how, if any of you could, just as I'm talking, type in what are they doing in order to help them develop those skills right now? And I'm going to talk about how we're going to do it within Play Attention. So now, right here in social skills, we have a module down here called social skills. This is one of our add-on modules. Social skills is actually going to teach them how to pick up on those social cues and respond appropriately. As we mentioned before, they have a real hard time, so they miss the look or the shake of the head. Now, in order to respond to social cues, you know that there's a lot going on during that social interaction. They have to be able to be paying attention to the social situation, right? And if you have a child who has low attention, then we need to address that. They have to be able to process what is going on in that social setting. And again, many of you not only have attention difficulties, but your child or your student also has slow processing, right? We also need impulse control so that once you process the information, you're not just responding, you're processing the information and then you're giving a thoughtful response, not an impulsive response. So you're developing that ability to stop, think, and then act instead of just reacting. Okay, so you know we need these things in place. And also we need to recognize that we have to pay attention to the person's social cue. Now, all of the activities within Play Attention work on attention because they're all attention enhanced, remember. All of them in the begin in the intermediate and advanced skill option track and monitor and enhance processing speed. So you're working on processing speed in every single activity. And all of the activities work on impulse control. Actually, that's one of your mini goals, right? One of your mini goals that Sheer Genius sets for you is to control that impulsivity. So in all of the activities within Play Attention, we're addressing those very uh, basic skills that are necessary for good social skills. Now, in addition to that, you can start incorporating the social skills program. And on social skills, what we're doing is helping them learn how to pick up those social cues. So they'll see a black screen, a black card on the screen. Once your child is focused and paying attention, that card will start to actually show a person with a specific social cue. And so it might be a, a person's face that is very happy or very sad. And as long as they're paying attention, they're able to show that, that expose that entire card. If they start to get distracted, the card will start to disappear. So we're only letting them respond once they see the entire face. Once they've exposed the entire face with their mind alone, they're asked, is this happy? sad, angry, and then they have to respond. So a lot is going on there. We're asking them to pay attention to a specific social cue. Then once they have it fully exposed, they're asked to respond. So they have to process at a certain time and then they select happy, 
sad, angry. And then as you get into the intermediate and advanced skill options, we actually start incorporating to make certain that you're able to match a happy person here with a happy person over here so that you're able to match up two different people. Or you're able to look at a person's expression and select the appropriate voice that's going with that person's expression, what will match up. So it gets a little bit more complex as you move up to intermediate and advanced skill options. So again, that's just one way we're going to enhance their ability to uh, get along with friends and pick up on those social cues. Now, many of you were talking about memory. How can we improve memory? Okay, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to incorporate uh, short-term memory. And if you, your child or your student has a hard time with remembering where things are located, we have spatial memory. If your child has a hard time with working memory, we also have a working memory version. Now, keep in mind, all of these activities won't start until you're in your peak attentive state. And in order to be able to process that information, they have to be focused. Once they're focused, we can work on short-term memory, which short-term memory helps with being able to remember dates, names, facts. And on this, we do get increasingly more difficult. So in the beginning, the game will not start until you focus. Now, this is a little bit different than attention stamina, because remember, attention stamina, we talked about how the uh, character would go down to the bottom of the ocean as long as you were paying attention. Now, your attention is not moving things on the screen. Your attention is now the on-off switch. So once you're focused, the game will start, and then it will give you a sequence of ser a series of lights and sounds, and then it'll say go. After it says go, you're going to input the corresponding uh, sequence using the corresponding arrow keys on your keyboard. So a lot is going on there to improve memory because memory is more than just remembering a sequence, right? You have to be able to pay attention. You have to be able to filter distractions. And then you have to be able to control your impulsivity. Because how many of you start telling your child or your student something and they don't listen to the entire uh, sentence, they just respond right away. So on this one, they have to start the activity with their attention. They have to watch the sequence, process that information, wait for it to say go before responding. So we're working on attention memory, impulse control, and processing speed. And that all working together will improve your memory. Now, you also want to make certain that, of course, all of these activities are, uh, they have an educational correlate. So you're always supposed to relate exactly what they're learning during their session and how to apply those skills back in the classroom and back at home. So if you have a child who is really struggling with that combination lock, you can use short-term memory to help improve that area. I had one little boy I worked with. He was in eighth grade, actually, and he really struggled with short-term memory. He could not remember sequences of two when we started. But then as we started to go through the process, he actually started to improve on the number of sequences he could remember. So he was up to fours and fives. And I asked him, you know, what are you doing to remember those longer sequences? Because you used to only be able to do two sequences, and that was even difficult. So what are you doing that's different? So again, you're trying to develop that metacognition, thinking about their own thinking. And he said, well, if it's red, green, blue, I repeat that to myself. I say red, green, blue, and then I respond. Well, that's rehearsal. You and I probably do that all the time, just naturally. You repeat it to yourself and then you respond. And if I give you a, a phone number, for example, 555-1212, you repeat it to yourself and then you put it into your phone. So that's what he had developed. Great. So when you're in the classroom, 
And the teacher says, put away your pencil, bring out your notebook, turn to page 46, repeat all of the information to yourself first, and then follow through. So here you're developing practical skills that will help reinforce memory. Spatial memory. So if the child actually gets homework done, he will remember where he put it so that he can turn it in on time. And working memory. This is that higher level thinking skill. So it's not just short-term memory where I give you information and you give the same exact information back to me. This is where uh, I give you a mathematical word problem. Like you have a quarter in your pocket and you go to the store and a stick of gum is five cents. How many pieces of gum can you purchase? So you're, a, you're going to have to take in that information, manipulate that information in some way, and then give a response. So that's much like the mathematical word problem. Now, I did mention that we're going to talk about math facts because a lot of you have students who have a hard time remembering those math facts. They know them one day and not the next. So we do have first grade and second grade addition and subtraction math facts. So that it's a kind of similar to social skills. They'll see a blank card and once they're focused and paying attention, they're able to expose the math uh, equation on the screen. If they get distracted, it will start to disappear. So they can only do the equation once they fully expose that with their mind alone. So it might say two plus three, and then they have to respond when it says go. So we're working on attention. We're working on math facts, and we're working on impulse control and processing speed. So again, you see how we're building on all of these cognitive skills to get to our end goal, which is to make these accommodations unnecessary, that they have these abilities so that they have strong executive function and self-regulation and can be more independent in the classroom and at home and eventually the workplace. Now, many of you talked about uh, organization and remaining on task, right? Because in order for us to get away or actually be able to move away from those three extra days for homework or to move away from having to um, have longer test time, because sometimes that is a great accommodation and sometimes that just is really frustrating for the student. So we need to be able to get away from that, right? To help them develop those abilities to plan, prioritize, organize their materials. Now, if we want them to be able to plan, prioritize, organize their materials and remain on task, these skills are all necessary. So every single activity you do within Play Attention is helping support that ability to plan and organize and remain on task. Specifically, though, of course, attention, stamina, time on task, and academic bridge are the three that if you really have concerns in these areas, these are the ones that I would strongly recommend we put into your plan. So we're encouraging them to actually increase their attention. But on time on task, if you have not yet used time on task, time on task encourages that ability to start, stay on task until completion. Now it's quite different again from attention stamina that we talked about. Attention stamina goes on for five, six, and seven minutes, beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and it stops after those times. But on time on task, since we're working on the ability to start and stay on task until completion, the beginner, intermediate, and advanced skill options will go on and on and on until you complete your task. In the beginning level, it's to mentally move 12 crates over to a flatbed truck and then drive that truck off the screen. Now, your child or your student is controlling a forklift driver with attention alone. Once he's focused and paying attention, he's able to move that forklift driver over to the left-hand side of the screen, pick up a crate, and then drive it back to the flatbed truck. Now, his goal is to move all 12 of those over to the flatbed truck and then drive that flatbed truck off the screen. And if he is starting right away, 
if he stays on task, if he's able to filter out all the distractions going on around him, this task will take him seven minutes or less. However, if he's procrastinating, if he's not focused, if he's daydreaming, if he's fidgeting, he's going to learn very quickly that that task is going to take him 11, 12, 13, 14 minutes to complete. So as he learns that he actually controls the amount of time it takes, you're going to notice that he's starting faster, he's able to remain on task and get it done in a timely manner. And then we're going to relate this back. This is just like when you have to do that five minute math assignment or you have 15 minutes of homework and it's supposed to take 15 minutes or that uh, science test that's supposed to take 30 minutes. Let's practice that. Let's take that same level of attention that we used in time on task and apply that to this 30-minute science quiz or this 15-minute math assignment. And then you're going to move right down here to academic bridge. Now, when you're doing the science or math or reading assignment, remember, they're still going to have that body wave armband on. And we're not monitoring where their eyes are. We're monitoring how attentive they are. So if they're paying attention to their reading, their spelling, their math, they're going to hear, good, great. If they start to get distracted during that activity, they'll hear focus. And then they have to focus back in in order to process the information and continue on. So this is where transfer and generalization of these skills learned are really taking place. You're actually now practicing that ability to start and complete in a timely manner. So eventually, we're going to be able to move away from having to have those three extra days for homework or the extended test time because we're going to actually teach and practice in a very structured way, teach and practice how to start and remain on task until completion. And that's really empowering. And, you know, there are a lot of different things we can do on Academic Bridge. So I encourage you to talk to your personal executive function coach specifically about the areas that they're having, uh, they're having difficulties paying attention to the academics. Because when we select the academic work, we want it to be on their independent level. So we are not going to take this time to teach them how to read or how to do math. Our goal here is teach them how to pay attention. To the task. Okay. Now I want to share with you how this really transfers and generalizes to the academic achievement. Because when I asked you how do we really uh, how do we um, how do we assess academic achievement, many of you said the standardized test. Now when I referred to my student, Jaylon, he was really bright. He was in second grade and he could call out answers to double digit addition and subtraction off the top of his head. But when he took the end of grade test, when that occurred, he tested out in the 65th percentile. Now I knew he was much smarter than that. He knew math better than 99% of his peers, and yet he tested out on that standardized test at the 65th percentile. And this is why I said earlier that those standardized tests aren't really, sometimes aren't really that accurate because that was not teaching his or assessing his ability to do math. He knew the answers. I knew he knew the answers. It was assessing his ability to stay on task and to complete that math test and to transfer his answers from his paper to that bubble sheet to control his impulsivity, to filter out all those distractions around him and to get that done in 40 minutes. That's what we were assessing at that time. And that's exactly what he struggled with. Those were his goals in his IEP or his 504 was to address those areas. And so When I kept him in the play attention program, I kept him in the full 40 hours. And at the end of grade test in third grade, he tested out in the 99th percentile. Now, I didn't make him any smarter. He was already that smart. 
I just helped him develop the skills he needed, these core cognitive skills he needed to really show what he knew. Again, this is how play attention is going to support all of those goals that you have. Uh, Quinn, you are having a difficult time hearing it on your PC because you have technical issues. No problem. We will send out the recording. So you'll receive the recording so you can watch the replay later. I hope that helps or I hope you could hear me say that. Okay. All right. Now, in addition to social skills training and remaining on task and your organization and your memory, you're going to be able to work on all of those cognitive skills that are going to make them successful. And if you like, this gave you kind of an overview. Oh, there was one other thing that you had mentioned. I knew there was one more area that we talked about, and that was filtering out distractions, right? Because a lot of you said that they have uh, preferential seating where they're sitting right next to the teacher. And as we mentioned, that's many times because they have a hard time filtering out that those distractions. You know, when I talk to especially a lot of our adult clients, they'll say, it's like there are a million different TV sets going on in my head all at the same time. Because ADHD is really a misnomer, isn't it? There's no one with a complete deficit of attention. They have great attention. It's just scattered over a variety of things. So they can tell you a little bit about what the teacher said, but they also know what the bird's doing outside and they know what Johnny's doing in the back of the room because they're picking up bits and pieces of everything. So in all of the activities within Play Attention, every single one, you're working on that ability to filter distraction. So we actually introduce in the intermediate and advanced skill options, we introduce uh distractors, both auditory and visual, so that they can learn how to filter those distractions. Also, your personal executive function coach will help make certain accommodations in the environment. So what we would recommend is when you start, if you have a child who's highly distractible, try to limit the number of distractions in the room. And what I used to do with my students is I'd have them wear headphones so that they could hear the play attention system, the play attention activities, but we were limiting the amount of environmental noise. But then once they get good, uh, they gain good success in that environment, they take the headset off. Now we're introducing more environmental distraction. Or what we also do is we let the phone ring. We let other people walk in or we let... Um, you know, you yourself might walk around the room a little bit to have some visual distraction. When you're doing that, when you're gradually introducing environmental distraction, you're giving them the opportunity to learn, number one, what affects them. Because remember, again, like with self-distracting behaviors, they're not really sure how these distractions affect them. You know, I know a lot of you think, well, he says he does much better if he has YouTube going on in the background and, or maybe he needs a squeezy ball. Well, we have to assess whether those things are really helping or not helping. And with my student, Jaylon, we actually did that experiment, you know, because he would have pencil wars on his desk all the time. He would get out every pen, pencil, crayon he had and he'd put it on his desk. And he'd be flipping those around. Now, I knew that was a distraction. He did not. But I said to him, now, what do you think is happening to your attention when you're flipping those pens and pencils around? I don't think it affects me. Okay, great. So next time we have a session, bring all of those pens and crayons up with you. And then we'll play attention stamina. And if you have that character down at the bottom of the ocean, and then I'm going to ask you to move those pens and crayons around. If you're able to do that and keep the character down at the bottom, then we'll never move those again. I'll never take those away from you again. But if it starts to float up, what does that mean? They're not paying attention. So we have to control that. We're going to have to get rid of that distraction so that you can pay attention. So you're going to help them actually learn what distracts them and how to control it once again. So that's what we're going to be doing with environmental distractions, both auditory and visual. So again, you're not only teaching them how to monitor, how to self-monitor, but also how to control that attention at will. Okay. 
So I hope this brings it all together and gives you a really good understanding of how play attention, that integrative approach with that feedback technology, with cognitive skill training and behavior shaping will help support all of your goals within your IEP and 504 plan to make certain that we can make lifelong changes. Now, whether you've started your play attention program or you have not yet started, in order to customize your plan, we do have a focus assessment. Focus is a norm reference test of attentional control. And when your student or your child takes the focus assessment, it takes about 20 minutes. It's computer-based, so you can do it at home or in your office or at your school. And when we complete the focus assessment, we have a full report that gives us how that gives us information on how that individual performed to the performance of his or her peers. And then we need about a 30 minute block of time with your personal executive function coach to take that information, talk further about different strengths and weaknesses in order to customize that person's profile within play attention. So there's a lot we can tell from this. And we look at the area of consistency. So if your child or student controls uh, <laughs> is lower than the norm in the area of consistency, then right away we know that that person probably has a hard time starting and completing in a timely manner. So we're going to make certain that we have uh, attention stamina, time on task, and the academic bridge in that profile. If they're lower than the norm in performance, then we know that that student is probably our daydreamer. You know, he may get an assignment done, but leaves out bits of information here or there, or has a hard time following through with verbal instructions. So in that profile, we're going to have attention stamina and probably auditory processing as well. And maybe even working memory would be a good one for that individual. And then impulsivity, we look at how they are with impulse control. And we're also able to show what types of distractions affect their performance. Is it auditory? Is it visual? Is it both? Or are they not distracted by those? So this is one way that we can further customize your plan. So if you have already started your play attention program and you're maybe 20 hours in and want to take a mid-assessment, we can do that. Uh, or if you are just about to start your play attention program, we should do focus assessment prior to starting so that we can customize your profile for your child or your student or yourself. You know, we're talking a lot about uh, uh, children today, but remember that play attention is appropriate for adults as well. Now, in addition to that focus assessment, play attention also documents student progress over time. So a lot of our parents or our teachers or client or professional clients will use the documentation within play attention to support uh, the learning process in the IEP. So you can print out these documents and actually put them in your student folders to show progress in these different areas because play attention is going to actually document and graph progress over time in all of these skill areas. So you're going to be able to see how they're performing in attention or ability to deal with distractions or impulse control. And you're going to be able to show progress over time. So these uh, progress reports are great for your IEP or 504 folders. You can also show comparison data. This is just a sample of the data that your student will see. Because as we know, a lot of our students are data driven and they like to see their graphs and charts as well and see their progress over time. And Play Attention does all of that for you. Now your customized program will improve focus, improve memory, impulse control, social skills, organization skills, the ability to filter auditory and visual distractions, improve task completion, and improve academic success. And we do all of this by improving cognitive skills that support strong executive function. If you have any additional questions, please do type your questions in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen in the Q&A box. If you would like a call back, just type in your phone number and one of our attention specialists will give you a call back here 
and address any of your remaining questions regarding play attention and how we can support your goals for this school year. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. We really appreciate you taking out the time to learn a little bit more. And as I mentioned, we are here to answer any additional questions or talk to you about how we can further customize your plan within Play Attention. Thanks so much. Take care.